what is happening around the world? And there are, there are, are four groups of countries or jurisdictions, if you like. So there are, first of all, those places which have legalised only assisted suicide, but not euthanasia. And we're, we're talking about a handful of US states and Switzerland, where the Dignitas Clinic operates. That law goes right back to the 1930s. And then secondly, there are countries which have legalised both euthanasia and assisted suicide, or in the case of Belgium, euthanasia only. So that's Canada, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Now, the Netherlands was first, followed by Belgium, then Luxembourg, and then Canada was just a couple of years ago. But we're getting data out of all of these places, which gives the same kinds of messages. And then there are other places where the battle is intense, but the law is not yet changed. And in particular, it would be the UK and Australia, because in Australia, there's now a very worrying uh, law in, in this coming up before the state of Victoria. But in Australia, like in the, U in the UK, there have been lots and lots of different bills uh, rather than court cases which have attempted to, to change the law. And then uh, in your handout, and we, we won't go into this in great detail, but there are a number of other countries where things are happening. But I want to concentrate primarily on the, the countries where the law has already changed and look at, look at what's happening in those countries. And what we see generally is uh, what we describe as incremental extension, where whatever the law you pass is, it's impossible to hold the boundaries of that law in practice. And that therefore the best law is the one that gives an absolute ban on all assisted suicide and euthanasia, but giving discretion to prosecutors and judges to temper justice of mercy in hard cases, which is what we have here. So uh, the threats come in, in different forms. There are bills, of course, which change the law. There are court cases which can also change the law, much more important in some jurisdictions than others. Uh, for example, in the US, the Supreme Court can change the law in a way that uh, then applies to every single state. And that's what happened with abortion and same-sex marriage. But the, the, uh, the Supreme Court now in the, in the US is, is balanced against a change in the law. And then uh, what I call non-prosecution or legalization by stealth. So this is where people are breaking the law, but nothing's happening. So the police are not investigating or the CPS is not prosecuting, parliament's turning a blind eye and so on. Uh, or legalization by stealth, which is, oh, but we're not really killing people. We're not giving them lethal injections, but we are, helping them to die in other ways through deliberate morphine overdose uh, for people who haven't got pain or um, withdrawal of treatment. Institutional capture is all about changing the position of something like the British Medical Association, which acts as a buttress, and then media and public opinion as well. So looking first at the US, and there are, there are five states which have legalized physician-assisted suicide. Uh, Hawaii has just joined them, so this is slightly out of date. And the first two were Oregon and Washington, which are the, the ones in the northwest there. And then the big long one below them, of course, is California. And that was hugely significant because that's the second most populous state in the U.S. after Florida. And uh, then Montana up the top, and then the other one up in the northeast is Vermont. Now, what's quite interesting is that all of these places are in left-leaning states, so the Democrat-held states. That's significant. But uh, also, all of these laws were changed uh, not by, by parliament, but by referendum. And of course, the danger of that is that because most people on a survey will say they want the law to change, it's very dangerous to go to <coughs> referendum on, on these issues. We find that generally where the arguments are heard in parliaments, people don't change the law. And then we've got these three countries in Western Europe, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and then Switzerland. And the only one of those countries which allows non-nationals to come is Switzerland. And the biggest sender of people to Switzerland is the UK and then Germany after, after that. Now, the pattern you see <coughs> everywhere is the same, 
Uh, this is Oregon, which changed the law in 1997. So they're, they're up to 20 years now. And you see an increase in numbers gradually every year. So you can see um, the, the, the green histogram is the, the deaths under the, dig dig the Death with Dignity Act in Oregon. And the blue ones are the prescriptions that have, are given. So you can see there are more prescriptions than deaths. And the way it works in Oregon, it's assisted suicide. You get prescribed the drugs, you take them home, and then you might decide not to use them. And of course, that creates all sorts of problems about lethal drugs being in the community and who, who might have access to them. And of course, the big problem being that the key witness is dead. So it's very difficult to tell what really happened uh, at the end and whether it was assisted suicide or not. Now, that's the law. Uh, you, you might wonder why in Britain they want it to be a mentally competent people with six months or less to live who are adults. Why are they always going for that, whether it's Maris or Falconer or whatever? It's because that's what Oregon does. So Oregon is seen as the gold standard by dignity and dying, and they're pushing for an Oregon-type law in Britain. And we find, because you, all you need to do is, is uh, Google the Death with Dignity Act Oregon, and you can bring up a website and read every single one of the 20 annual reports every year. And the data is, is very well documented. So we know from that uh, a third die for fear of being a burden. That's the reason they give. That less than one in 20 have psychiatric evaluations, but we know from other data that one in six are depressed. But the whole thing is based on self-reporting. So there was an early report where they said, well, the whole thing could be a cock and bull story, but we trust doctors to be their usual honest selves. And of course, th that is the problem, is that if you are involved in something illegal, then of course you're going to report it in a way that won't incriminate you, aren't you? And I alluded to this earlier, that the reasons, and you, both in Oregon and Washington, every year they will publish the exact percentages of people and the reasons they give for wanting to make use of the act. And you can see here the top three, decreasing enjoyment of life. Well, I mean, who, who doesn't experience that <laughs> as, as uh, age progresses? Uh, loss of autonomy. Again, you know, the things I used to be able to do, I can no longer do. Driving the car, you know, going to the club or whatever. And loss of dignity. And so these, the point is, these are not medical symptoms. They are existential symptoms, or we might even call them spiritual problems. And of course, they don't have medical solutions either. But these are the main reasons that people are giving. So when you hear that, you know, Everyone's in terrible pain, and this is why it's just not borne out by the evidence. Barbara Wagner is, uh, or was, she's, she's no longer alive now, um, but she had cancer. She was uh, offered initially chemotherapy. The drug was very expensive. Uh, she uh, therefore was denied it under the Oregon Health Department. So she wrote to the Oregon Health Department asking, if special uh, provision could be made for her. And she received a letter back from the department saying, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to fund your chemotherapy, but we can fund your assisted suicide, if you'd, if you'd like that. And of course, the, 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 don't worry, this is not the only place this has happened. And, and you see, the, the point is this, that if, if you, once you make assisted suicide, a medical treatment, then of course it's going to be costed like every other treatment. And if it's a much cheaper treatment than chemotherapy or palliative care is, which is very HR dependent, then uh, isn't a health administrator going to think, well, how many of this kind of treatment could we provide? How many of that kind of treatment? How many of this one? And it's going to be weighed up in that way. Well, she didn't uh, take that. There's a very famous uh, court case going on in Canada at the moment uh, with a disabled man who's, 
who's also been offered assisted suicide, but he wants care that's, so he can stay at home. And the government will not, will not fund his care at home, but they will fund his assisted suicide, so he's taking them to court. So uh, Switzerland. <laughs> so th Switzerland's a special situation because assisted suicide's been le uh, legal for a long, long time. I think it was something due to people falling down crevasses and not being able to be rescued, and so they offered them a way out. I'm not, it's had some bizarre history to it. And the thing about Switzerland is that they, they do uh, provide it for expatriates as well. There are two main organizations, Dignitas, which is the one we hear about all the time, and a smaller one called Exit International. And um, interestingly, there was, a, there was a referendum in Zurich back in 2011, and the majority of, of Swiss people voted to, for the status quo to keep this there. So public opinion is in support of it. No chance of a change in the law. Now, these figures are a little bit uh, dated now, but this is, um, this is Ludwig Manali here, who uh, set up the Dignitas Clinic. And you can see the numbers. I, I, I said UK was the biggest. It's actually Germany that's the biggest. But you can see the major contributors. And uh, of course, their cases are quite carefully documented as well. So we know the diagnoses. And as you'd expect, the, the highest number have cancer or degenerative neurological conditions, but also arthritis, blindness, spinal injury, diabetes, or just you know tired of life. So people who are not terminally ill and uh, who uh, you know, would not qualify under any other law. So that's the, the blue house where it all, all happens. And this, this lady, Soraya Vernley, who used to work for them, uh, blew the whistle uh, on them and provided some very interesting uh, news stories. But there were reports when Dignitas was uh, originally based in one of the cities of, uh, you know, body bags and elevators, because they were, they were doing these uh, assisted suicides just in a normal residential block. So they had to get the bodies out in, in some way and occasionally residents would meet one coming up and down in a black bag. Uh, cremation urns and the way they were disposed of, uh, but she said particularly that the cost that Manali was making a lot of money through it. And then uh, some divers retrieved over a hundred of these cremation urns out of Lake Zurich. Now it was, it was said that um, Manali was saying that he was giving these, uh, these cremation urns respectful burials, but actually part of the, the money-making saga was that they just got in a rowboat, rowed them out into the lake and gently dropped them over the edge. And this, this was all, you might remember it if you were following it, it was in British newspapers and this, this picture of the, the guys with the cremation urns. So, uh, but uh, things aren't going to change in Switzerland and there will be a steady trickle of people from the UK up to 30 or 40 per year who go there at the moment. Canada, uh, first Quebec legalized it and then throughout Canada and uh, the Canadian law is one of the most radical in the world. There's no time limit on it. People with a grievous and irremediable medical condition. So that's very, very broad and subjective. And uh, the first report came out uh, 970 reported assisted deaths in, in Canada over the first six months, uh, 463 in Quebec, five, uh, sorry, total of, of 970. And then in Ontario, doctors are legally required to perform euthanasia or to refer. So the, the thing is, if the law does not have a strong conscience clause in it, these figures are not the latest and they've continued to, to go up in, in Canada. So this is uh, later this year, Canadian doctors and nurse practitioners have reported they've killed almost 4,000 people since euthanasia was legalised in Quebec in December 2015. So a much bigger population than the Netherlands. The Netherlands, uh, now they have a different law, so it's both euthanasia and assisted suicide uh, uh, legal in certain conditions. And what we've seen is a 15 to 20% increase per year of numbers who've been making use of this. And there you can see the 2016 figures, over 6,000 deaths and 4% of all deaths were uh, involved. Um, mentally competent children, uh, 
incompetent people with uh, dementia and other mental health conditions and a move also from the terminally ill to the chronically ill and under the Groningen protocol, babies with spina bifida uh, and that's been in peer reviewed medical journals. So that's the picture in the Netherlands. And then you get these stories which make news around the world. So this was a female Dutch doctor drugged a patient's coffee, then asked her family to hold her down as she fought not to be killed. But they did not break the country's euthanasia laws because there was no uh, conviction. And in both the Netherlands and, uh, and Belgium, we've seen very little uh, happening there. Luxembourg, of course, has such a, a tiny population and they were about seven years after the Netherlands and Belgium in changing the law, and it was a very slim majority, similar kind of law, two doctors and a panel of experts. And what's, what's interesting about the Luxembourg situation is that the, the sovereign of Luxembourg, Grand, Grand Duke Henry, opposed the law, and he refused to, to sign it into, into uh, law. And so they removed his powers. So uh, his signature is no longer now required on any legislation, but that was the key issue that led to him. So he exercised his conscience, bravely vetoed, but they simply stripped him of his power to veto uh, legislation after that. Belgium, so we've had 16 years now, 20% uh, of nurses involved, 50% of euthanasia nurses have killed without consent. Now, the reason that's uh, important is because under Belgian law, only doctors can carry out euthanasia. And they can only do it in cases where the patient is mentally competent, so only for voluntary euthanasia. So when you read 50% of euthanasia nurses have killed without consent, uh, we, we see clearly that when you change the law, people don't only just move up to the new law, but they'll move beyond it as, as well. So there are the Belgian figures. Those have continued to go up at that kind of uh, rate. Uh, there's the report warning to Britain is almost half of Belgium's euthanasia nurses have admit to killing without consent. Now, how do we know this? Well, it all comes out of confidential surveys, but um, no one disputes these things. So about a third of the cases are involuntary. A lot of them are unreported. The latest thing in Belgium is what's called uh, organ transplant euthanasia, which is where you, uh, you say, well, you, if you're having euthanasia, could we use the organs and therefore uh, transplant them before as part of the process of ending your life so that someone else will get life? And in Canada at the moment, there's a big debate over this because they realize they want to push ahead with organ transplant euthanasia in Canada, but they can't do it under the current law because a person has to be dead before you can harvest the organs. And so there are people in Canada now, bioethicists are arguing that they should change the law to allow the person not to be dead before the organs are harvested in organ transplant euthanasia. So some of the, it, it tends to be the extreme cases that, that make the news. Uh, the, the verbesum twins were, were uh, were already uh, blind, they were going deaf. They had euthanasia together because they felt their lives were not worth living. There was the case of Angie with anorexia. And Nathan Verhelst uh, pictured here who had a sex change operation that went wrong and he was deeply depressed about it. So lots of individual cases. This was another controversial one. Frank uh, van den Bleeken who won the right to euthanasia after claiming he could not face the rest of his life in in jail. So it's not just about uh, medical conditions. And most recently in Belgium, the, the law has been changed now to allow uh, euthanasia for, for minors. So this is the nine and 11 year old in the youngest cases worldwide. And, and you could see all, all of these are British newspapers, uh, but no one is denying these stories. <coughs> Uh, here's a, a quote, Dean of the Faculty of Law in University in Belgium. When euthanasia was authorised 12 years ago, it was presented as an ethical transgression, an exception reserved for extreme situations. 12 years later, its scope has expanded considerably. 
So the pattern is that when you change the law, you get a, an annual increase in numbers. But you also get an expansion of categories of people to be included. So what starts with the terminally ill then becomes the chronically ill. What starts with the physically ill then includes the mentally ill. And what begins with adults then, be, then moves to children. And what starts with the mentally people of mental capacity then moves to those without mental capacity, as we see a third of the cases in, in Belgium. And uh, of course, the, the thing behind all this is that there are no prosecutions. So that even when people do break the law, they're not uh, brought to, to justice. And so therefore, uh, they will take more liberties. And I guess the, the, the overall message of all of this is that it is impossible to legislate in a way that you can contain it just to the people within the bounds of your legislation. And that therefore the best law is, is a total ban, but giving discretion to judges and prosecutors. And we'll come back to that a little bit more when we look at the, at the arguments. I, I mentioned earlier the, the Europe, European End of Life Care Europe group that, that I'm involved in. And uh, one of the members of that is uh, Caroline Rue, who heads up Alliance Vita, which is the big pro-life organization in France, who've been incredibly effective at doing uh, campaigning. And this, uh, uh, there's a real culture of protest in France that we don't really have in this country. So you can get tens of thousands of people out on the streets to, to do things, and it could be a real family occasion. So uh, this was one where they all dressed up as corpses and body, body bags to protest against a change in the law. And so far in France, they've held the line. In Italy, euthanasia and assisted suicide are both illegal, uh, but there have been some high profile treat withdrawal of treatment cases. Uh, Spain, similar. Germany, there's a loophole in the law where there's no legislation specifically covering assisted suicide. And uh, the uh, federal court has now ruled that patients should have access to life-ending drugs for assisted suicide. But there is a ban on any commercial assisted suicides. And so on an individual basis, it's very unlikely that you will be prosecuted if you're involved in, in Germany. Now, one of the saving graces in, in Europe is that under the European Court of Human Rights, there, it's ruled that there's no obligation for states to ensure access to assisted suicide. And uh, this means that the, the European courts tend to take quite a relaxed view of this it, and, and what they call the margin of appreciation. They allow states to have laws which are quite different than those of other states, but it doesn't create any legal precedent. So the fact that it's been legalized in the Netherlands and in, in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg doesn't therefore mean that there's a legal precedent forcing other countries like the UK to go down the same route. So the European courts uh, give a lot of flexibility to the individual states to legislate as they prove, as they, as they choose. And then just a, a few sobering thoughts to, to finish. This is the European demographic time bomb. Now, on the, on the left there, you have the age histogram from the United, United States, but Europe is very similar. And on the right, uh, we've got one from Nigeria. So that's a typical developing world country with lots and lots of young people. And of course, that's what Britain looked like back in the 1940s and 50s. But now we're much more like the one on the left. And I'll show you some later on from Japan, which show how the demography changes so that there are fewer and fewer people younger than 15, fewer, a smaller percentage in the working population and growing numbers of over 65s in the population for a variety of reasons, but in large part because of a combination of falling birth rates and abortion and the fact that people are living longer as well. And uh, we'll come back uh, to that. But this is uh, a, a sobering quote. As soon as he goes beyond 60 to 65 years of age, man lives beyond his capacity to produce and he costs society a lot of money. A euthanasia will be one of the essential instruments of our future societies. Now, um, 
No, I'm 60. We're, we're talking before. You're 65, aren't you? So this is, you know, this is real for us uh, now. And you might say, well, who's Jacques Attali? Well, uh, Jacques Attali was the uh, president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which, so who's a leading financier in, in Europe when he said this. And he lost his job when it was discovered that he had spent more on the marble in the foyer of the bank than he had on loans to Eastern Europe, which was why it was set up after, after the, the um, Berlin Wall came down. So, of course, now he's moved into that grey zone of being 60 to 65 years or older. What goes around comes around, they say. So uh, th there aren't many people making explicit statements like this about economics, but there are a lot of people thinking this way. I didn't uh, mention earlier on that um, when the British Medical Association put out their guidance and we wrote a submission to it as Christian Medical Fellowship and we quoted in that from their Supreme Court evidence about £122,000 could be saved on every case that didn't have to go to court. And we put that up on our website and they did not like that at all. And they said we had misquoted them and they said that if we did not take it down off the website, they would be alerting their legal team and we had until next Wednesday to do it. So uh, we, we simply wrote back and said, well, what we can do is quote the entire paragraph from your Supreme Court evidence, but it's even more incriminating and we don't think it would help your case. And at that point, they backed off completely and, and then uh, denied that they'd made legal threats. So and then their next letter said, we did not make any legal threats. We simply said that if you did not remove that submission from your website, we would alert our legal team. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's, that's where it is at the moment. So uh, 23 doctors at Nuremberg, not many people know this. We, we might uh, come, come back to this, but some of them, of course, were convicted. And uh, this... This is a very interesting quote from Leo Alexander, who was a psychiatrist who gave evidence at the Nuremberg trial. So you can see the date, 1949. And the article that this comes from in the New England Medical Journal is called Medical Science Under Dictatorship. And it's an absolutely classic article. If you Google it, Leo Alexander, Medical Science Under Dictatorship, it's an extraordinary article. And if you, if you can't find it, I can send you a copy. But this is what he said. The beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in, in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. It started with the attitude basic in the euthanasia movement that there is such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. And this attitude in its early stages concerned itself with the severely and chronically sick, but gradually the sphere of those to be included was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally all non-Germans. And this is, uh, you know, the reality is that all you need for a great expansion in, uh, in practice is favorable public opinion, a handful of willing doctors, economic pressure, and then finally a law allowing it. And it's the last one that we don't have yet uh, in, this, in this country. So now I'll, I'll come back to that and look at that a bit more when we look at arguments. And you've got to be very, very careful with allusions to, to Germany, but I, I will show you the steps by which the whole thing happened uh, very, very gradually that most people aren't aware of. So we've got about 10 minutes or so for questions on that section before we look more at the arguments. So anything on other jurisdictions? Uh, there's certainly pushback, and some of the, the best organized groups who are opposed to assisted suicide are in these states. And of course, the best evidence is coming out of them too. So uh, especially places like Oregon and Washington, uh, the problem is that the door is already closed on them. But they don't see the battle as over, because in the US, of course, there are 50 odd states where uh, they have to change the law one by one. It's going to take a long period of time. And I think the Democrat states are much easier than the Republican ones, you know. Uh, 
Although, note my comments already about the UK where people don't see it as a left-right issue, but it still is seen like that in the US. And the worry has always been that they would get a certain number of states and then bring a case to the Supreme Court, which would make it available everywhere in the same way that the Roe versus Wade judgment did in 73 on abortion or the Obergefell judgment did on same-sex marriage, that that might happen with euthanasia. And so if you've been following what's been happening, you can't avoid it, can you, across the Atlantic um, with the Supreme Court appointments. That's all about the balance of the Supreme Court because at the moment now, because of the most recent appointment that's been made, it's now 5-4 uh, conservative to liberal. And so uh, Democrats are very worried about the law changing back on things. But it, it now looks as though for euthanasia, it's pretty safe in terms of protecting the US from a blanket ruling that would apply uh, everywhere. But that's not to stop state by state being picked off. And if you're on the email lists of, of our allies abroad there, you'll find ev every, every day there's something new happening. There have been well over 100 attempts to change laws in individual US states. And you can see from the figures that the vast majority of them have actually failed. And, and when they go to, to parliament, uh, invariably they tend to fail. It's when it's driven by a refer referendum that you get the, um, you know, you get, you get the judgment. So we, we all know about referenda here, don't we? So. So I've, I've never used that argument on the media, but we're, we will use it with supporters uh, simply so that people can see how it happened. And I've got a few slides in the later presentation which give put more flesh on the bones as to how it did happen. And most people are ignorant of, of how it happened. I think the other thing in Germany was that that a lot of those involved in pushing it were in very powerful positions in the medical colleges and medical schools. So they were very high profile people. And, uh, you know, in ad addition to that, uh, the main problem was that, I think Alexander said this later in his article, something along the lines of that the, the real responsibility for what happened not just in the hospitals, but actually more widely, rests upon the medical profession. Because the, the vast bulk of the medical profession uh, did not protest and allowed themselves to be led and ruled by those who went through this route. You know? So what we would call the, the sin of silence, I guess. And uh, it's uh, Edmund Burke's famous quote, isn't it, that all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, where there's a will, there's an anxious relative. Yeah, yeah, quite. <laughs> and so there are lots of vested interests, aren't there, at, at all levels. And I'll, I'll tell you in the next section, there's a, been a recent case in Australia where someone has been convicted for assisting his wife's suicide when there was a very large inheritance at, at stake. So. Well, I mean, it's been, it's been said that the, the generation that killed its children yeah. might well be, in turn, killed by its children because of the way, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll look at, at demography and the way that's changing later on, because it's very, very interesting.